Omar, and this is video number five on our road to the RSA encryption algorithm, and it's part of a long series of videos on discrete mathematics at Harvey Mudd College. So today's focus is going to be about prime numbers. So first we should start off with defining what a prime number actually is. Now we might have some intuition about what it is from the past, but let's actually think about a good concrete way to define it. So we think about primes as things like 2, 3, 5, 7, 11. They're numbers that can't be decomposed when looking at writing them as products. So another way to word this is a positive integer p is prime if it has exactly two divisors, one in itself. So for example, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, they're all numbers whose divisors are only themselves and the number 1. 1 is not prime because 1 only has 1 as a divisor. It doesn't have two divisors. And I should add here when I say two divisors, I mean two positive divisors. So today's video is going to be all about understanding primes. Why is it the case that numbers decompose into a product of primes? How many primes are there? And let's get an understanding of how we can look at greatest common divisors in terms of prime factorization. So one of the first things we're going to establish or we're going to need along the way is the following lemma, which is lemma 12 in our book. And it says that if a and b are positive integers and p is a prime, with p dividing the product of a and b, then that actually means that p has to divide one of the two factors. So we'll say p divides a or p divides b. Now the thing here I want to mention is in mathematics when we have this or, it doesn't mean it's exclusive. So we say p divides a or p divides b or both, possibly. All right, so how do we go about actually establishing the reason why? Now the thing is, you might think to yourself if you have experience with prime factorization to think of prime factorizing a and b, but we actually have improved that every positive integer can be factored into a product of prime. So we need to do something a little bit different. So one thing we could do is say, hey, if p doesn't divide a, then because we're trying to conclude that p divides a or p divides b, then try to prove that p is forced to divide b. So we'll suppose that p doesn't divide a. Let's think about what that means in terms of factorizations. So a doesn't have p as a factor. Let's think about the common factors of p and a then. Well, the only factors of p, because p is prime, are p and 1. So the greatest common divisor of a and p is 1. It's the only common factor they have. Since the only divisors of p are 1 and p, and p is not a divisor of a, then the greatest common divisor of a and p is 1. Now we can actually do something with this because we have at our disposal from a previous video, Bezu's lemma, that tells us that if we have the greatest common divisor of a and p being 1, then there's a linear relationship between a and p. Namely, we can find through Bezu's lemma that there are integers x and y, so that ax plus py is 1. Now somehow we want to use this, because it's the only real thing we have to work with, to prove that because of the fact p doesn't divide a, that p has to divide b. And we're given this information that p actually divides a, b. So if we can use this somehow to get a factor of a, b somewhere in the picture, that'll force p to divide b, that'd be helpful. And a possible way to do this is to introduce a factor of b by multiplying by b here. If we do that, we'll have a, b here, which p is a factor of. We'll have p, b here, which p is a factor of because we have a p here. And so the sum of these has to be divisible by p, but the sum is actually b, and that gives us the conclusion we want. Okay, so I'll get rid of these red marks here and say that b a x plus b p y is b. Now since p divides a b, p divides a b x, moreover p divides b p y, so p divides b. And the reason being that b is a sum of two things that we've established both have p as a factor. All right, so we have our key building block of divisibility with respect to primes. If you have a prime dividing a product of things, it has to divide one thing or the other. And really, Bezu's lemma was at the heart of the reason why we're able to do this. So now let's use this to be able to establish what's called the fundamental theorem of arithmetic that says that any positive integer can actually be written as a product of primes. So the statement of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic says the following. Given any positive integer n greater than or equal to 2, you can write n as a product of one or more primes, and they're not necessarily distinct. So as an example, the number 18 can be written as 3 times 3 times 2. We could have rearranged this to be 2 times 3 times 3, or 3 times 2 times 3, 
But effectively, there's only one way to do this where you're considering two ways to be equal if you rearrange the order that you wrote the primes in. And that's the next part of the statement. Moreover, this can be done in a unique way up to the reordering of the primes. So we see this is the same list of primes that we have, uh, possibly with a reordering. Okay, so we're going to prove both of these things. Before getting into the proof of the first one, I want to give some intuition. So let's say you have some number n, and you're wondering whether or not it can be written as a product of primes. Well, if it is a prime, then we're good, because it says a product of one or more primes. That would mean that it's written as one prime. Now, if it's not prime, then it has a factor other than one in itself. Let's call that factor like a. Then n divided by a would have to be an integer, so there's another factor, b. And we selected a so that it's not 1 or n. That consequently means b is also not 1 or n. So we think to ourselves, how do we write n as a product of primes? If both are prime, we get n as a product of primes. If a is not prime, we decompose it into a product of two numbers and keep going down the chain and eventually get a product of primes. But there's sort of a nicer way to encapsulate this idea without going down this possibly long descending chain, breaking each number up into products of products of products. We can think about this from the process of using strong induction. So what we can say is if we assume that all numbers less than a given positive integer n actually factor into a product of primes, if n is prime, then it is a prime and we're happy. If it's not, we can represent it as a product of two things that are smaller, and by induction, each of those things can be written as product of primes, and then we're happy. So we're going to write that whole process out. It's kind of long-winded, but let's get the ideas down in order to prove this first part, and then move on to the second part about the reordering. So to go to our proof, we're going to let n greater than equal to 2 be a positive integer. All right, if n is 2, then n is a product of 1 prime. I know that seems kind of weird because there's just one prime involved, but we're really writing a list of primes and taking products, so it's okay to just have one. Okay, so our idea then was to start with this n and split it up and use induction. So we're going to use strong induction. So we'll assume for induction that for all k greater than or equal to 2, with k less than n, k is a product of primes. Now the reason I say k greater than or equal to 2 is because our statement in our original theorem was that our number started greater than or equal to 2. Okay, so our idea was if n is prime, it is the product of one prime. If n is not prime, pick a with one less than a less than n, so that a divides n. The reason we can pick a so that one is less than a is less than n is because n is not prime, so it has a factor other than n or one. Okay, so now this a has to be at least two. So by our induction hypothesis, a is going to be factored into, can be factored into a product of primes. Okay, so first we need to find this other factor here, so such that a divides n, and say n is a times b, right? Then we're saying by induction, we'll move up here, and b can be written as a product of primes. I mean, you might as well list this. Say a is p1 up to pk, and b is q1 up to ql, then n is the product of all of these, and these are all primes, so we've written n as a product of primes. Okay, great. So what do we take from a proof like this? So actually, a lot of times, inductive proofs give you algorithms. For example, let's say you wanted to write 24 as a product of primes and you didn't know how. This algorithm gives you an idea. 24 itself is not prime, so find a factor of it, any factor you like, maybe 6 and 4, and then if you find a way to write 6 as a product of primes and 4 as a product of primes, put those lists together to get n being a product of primes. So here, for example, this is 2 times 3, and this is 2 times 2. So 24 is 2 times 3 times 2 times 2. Okay, so the next thing we need to prove is that if you write a positive integer as a product of primes in two different ways, then those two ways are the same with possible reordering of where the primes appear. Okay, so in that light, let's say we wrote n as a product of these primes and a product of these primes. There's m primes here and l primes here. We don't even know at face value that the number of primes in each list is the same. We don't know at all. 
Okay, but if you look at this, this number right here is in factor prime. So since it's a factor of n, q1 divides this list right over here. Okay, so this is a product of numbers here, and we're saying q1 divides their product. So what we can do is something like the following. I'm not going to write out all the details, but q1 divides this product. So by the theorem we proved a little bit earlier, this prime number is dividing a product. So if you split the product into two pieces, Q1 is going to divide one piece or the other. Let's say, for example, there are three numbers in this list. We can think about writing them as the product of these two things. So Q1 is going to divide this, or Q1 is going to divide this product. If Q1 divides this product, then we have Q1 dividing P1. If Q1 divides this product, then Q1, again, divides the product into two things, so it has to divide one or the other. So we get q1 divides p2, or q1 divides p3. If we had a huge list of primes here, then this process would be more inductive. But we can see through this iterative process that q1 is going to divide one of these pi's. OK, so q1 divides p sub i for some i. So we have a prime number dividing another prime number. What does that mean about these numbers? Well, this is not the number 1. This is a prime number, so the only factors that it possibly has are itself and 1. We have a factor here that's not 1. So this means q1 actually equals p sub i. Okay, so now we have these two are equal. And so if we divided n by q1 and n by p sub i over here, we get that n over q1 is q2, q3, up to qm, and n over p sub i is p1 with, I'm going to use this notation for pi removed, up to pl. Maybe I'll put a proof sketch here instead of the details, and the details are actually in the book. So now you can imagine we have these two numbers that are the same, because q1 and pi are the same. So you repeat the process, right? So as a consequence, if you repeat, Q2 is going to equal one of these pj's, maybe pi prime. And you continue to get that this list is a rearrangement of our original list of primes here. So it's a cool idea that uses the fact that if you have a prime dividing a product, then it has to divide one of the individual pieces. And if a prime divides another prime, those two primes are actually equal. So now that we've established the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, let's use it to get a sense of how to find greatest common divisors in terms of prime factors. To motivate this, I've written down the prime factorizations of 600 and 720 as well. Now, if we pick an integer n and it divides both 600 and 720, then its prime factors have to be chosen from the list of numbers 2, 3, and 5. We can't have, for example, a 7 in the prime factorization because that's to divide each of these, and we already said that if you have a prime dividing a product of things, then it has to divide one of the individual pieces. So it's going to have to actually appear in one of these lists. So if n is the greatest common divisor of these two numbers, then n is going to look like 2 to the a times 3 to the b times 5 to the c for some non-negative integers a and b. And we're trying to make n as big as possible so it is actually the greatest common divisor. So how can we do that? Well, first of all, this number 2 to the a has to divide both these numbers right over here. So we can't have this exponent being greater than 3 or else we won't get divisibility on this side. And we'll be okay right over here. So we can pick a to be the minimum of the numbers 3 and 4 to get the maximum possible power of 2 that we can out of this. Similarly, we can make b the minimum of the exponents 1 and 2, and c to be the minimum of the exponents 2 and 1. Now if we do that, we get a being 3, b being 1, and c being 1 to give us 2 cubed times 3 times 5. Okay, but can we actually argue that this is the greatest common divisor? Well, again, any common divisor has to look like this by our prime factorization argument. 
right? And then we see that because of this form, and we see because 2 to the a has to divide each of these things, then a has to be bounded above by the minimum of these exponents. So a indeed will be at most 3. And here we've achieved 3 actually. The same argument goes for b and c as well. So this thing actually indeed is the greatest common divisor. So in general, if you had a written as a product of primes with these powers right over here, where the ai exponent is the exponent of the i of prime number, and b was written like this as well, then the GCD of AB can be read from the prime factorization. And it's 2 to the C sub 1, 3 to the C sub 2, 5 to the C sub 3, etc., where CI is the minimum of AI and BI. So a nice other convenient way to look at GCDs if we have prime factorization at our disposal. One of the things I should mention here is you might think, why not just use this for GCDs in general? Well, as an algorithm, this turns out to be very expensive from a computational point of view. Prime factorizing numbers is actually really difficult to do algorithmically. The Euclidean algorithm, which we used earlier to do GCDs, happens to be a very fast algorithm. The number of steps it actually takes is about logarithmic in the data that's input. So it's a really much better algorithm to use in practice. But this helps in theory. Okay, so the last topic we want to talk about today, which is a nice treat, is a proof of the fact that there are actually an infinite number of primes. We don't know that yet, um, but this is something that will be useful for us in the future. So this is sometimes called Euclid's proof of the infinitude of primes, and it's actually a proof by contradiction. And what it does is it assumes that there's a finite list of primes and creates a new number that has to forcibly have a new prime divisor in it, and that causes a contradiction. So suppose otherwise, and we'll let p1 through pn be the list of the existing primes, there are no others. So the number we're going to create is a number that's going to force divisibility problems. So we're going to consider the number n, which is the product of all of these pi's plus 1. All right, let's think about this number, why it's constructed this way. So according to the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, n should be able to be written as a product of primes. Okay, so if that's the case, then one of these numbers is going to have to divide this number right over here. We're going to see that that's a problem. So suppose p sub i divides n. Well, p sub i divides all this. So if p sub i divides this thing and divides all this, it divides our difference. So p sub i would divide 1. But 1 doesn't have any factors that are prime numbers. So this is a contradiction. So pi does not divide n for any i. Well, if n has no prime factors, then it can't be factored into a product of primes, which contradicts the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. So this contradicts the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Cool. So a nice, clean argument for why there has to be an infinite number of primes. If you assume there's a finite number, you can create a number that can't be factored into primes, which contradicts the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. So that ends our discussion, at least today, of prime numbers, and the end of the fifth video on our road to the RSA algorithm. In the next video, we're going to talk about remainders upon division and how to use them to simplify a lot of calculations by introducing the concept of modular arithmetic. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please click the like button. And if you want to see more videos like this, subscribe to the channel.